is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwood. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Chinese manufacturing activity rises by the most in over a decade, spurring a rally in stocks and commodities. Bloomberg understands that U.S. businesses are poised to invest billions of dollars into Northern Ireland if the British Prime Minister is able to gain political support for his new Brexit deal with the EU+. Plus, Results are in for Nigeria. The ruling party's Bola Tinubu is declared winner in the presidential election amid opposition protests. Now, first thing is first, so let's check in on the markets. We're getting a boost because of what's going on in China and some of the optimism surrounding activity, surrounding housing, and of course, that has implications for the National People's Congress that starts on Sunday with a possible new forecast for growth. Now, European stocks uh, in higher, not only because of the recovery in China, but also better than expected overall sentiment for earnings. Your area, February manufacturing PMI, pretty much in line with expectations, 48.5. A preliminary was also 48.5, so it is in contraction territory because it's below 50. We had France a little bit softer than expected. We had Germany a little bit softer than expected. We also also have the French central bank governor testifying in the Assemblée Nationale over in France and really the message there is we will deal with inflation he's expecting peak interest rates in September all right S&P futures getting some three tenths of a percent euro dollar on the back of those PMIs but really huge huge repricing uh, on the ECB peak expectations that started to happen yesterday and then a crude oil 84.12 let's also look at the European map to see if there's meaningful differences usually they're not sometimes there are today they're not that much between the FTSE and the CAC um, also the FTSE MIB and they're all around four tenths of a percent higher between three tenths and six tenths of a percent higher so factory data and the world's second largest economy has surged the most in a decade beating analyst expectations well, China's official manufacturing PMI came in at 52.6 from the month of February, well above the 50.6 estimate. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Chief Asia Economics Correspondent. He's Enda Kern. Enda, good morning, good afternoon. So what can we read from this? This is the first clean set of numbers that we have from China since the reopening. It is, and it's a positive read on China's economy. It indicates actually recovery is going faster than expected and faster than the initial recovery when the pandemic broke out back in 2020. Like you mentioned, we had the PMI today, Francine, coming in at 52.6. Quite strong growth broad-based there on the services side with indications of consumer spending, for example, but also a rebalancing with manufacturing strength, also surprisingly picking up an increase in manufacturing employment as well, also, for example. And on the housing side, we had data suggesting that uh, housing sales increased uh, on year for the first time since around the middle of 2021. So a broad sweep of numbers covering the services side of the economy, the manufacturing side of the economy, and a look at the housing side of the economy, and all told it points to a pretty robust recovery and shows that China's uh, exit from COVID-0 is somewhat on track. So, and we also have the National People's Congress. It starts on Sunday. What does the latest reading mean for growth forecast going forward? I think it has to be a good backdrop for when those officials do gather in Beijing. Like you mentioned, it begins on Sunday. It's kind of a rubber stamp parliament, sets out policy, policy for the year ahead. There will be an economic growth target unveiled on Sunday. Economists are expecting that to come in at least at 5%, probably over 5% which is a pretty robust figure for China, given where a year ago many people were, only, were continuing to mark down their forecast for China and warning of longer-term structural decline. But it seems to be better mood music around the activity indicators at the moment. The authorities are focusing on growth. We know they're going to continue to support the economy. So I think for the near term, at least, it does sound like the, uh, the narrative around China's recovery, economic recovery, will remain somewhat upbeat. All right, thank you as ever uh, for your great analysis. Our Enda Curran there in Hong Kong joining us this morning. Now, Goldman Sachs shares fell yesterday as the bank hinted at further dismantling of its struggling consumer business during its investor day in New York. Well, Bloomberg's Shanali Bazak was there for us. It was a highly anticipated investor day for Goldman Sachs here in New York, and management is looking to Goldman Sachs 
2.0. That is the investment bank and trading businesses supported by a $2.5 trillion asset management behemoth. Now, this all comes after a pivot in the consumer business. They've renamed that unit a platform services business, and they don't expect it to break even until 2025. That also comes in the middle of a tough economic environment. We spoke earlier to Goldman Sachs COO and President John Waldron. This is what he had to say. Most of our clients are very concerned about the inflation, particularly corporate clients. They see it being more persistent in their businesses. The marketplace is a little bit more complacent, I would say, on inflation, in terms of how the market trades inflation. That, to me, is a disconnect that has to get adjudicated over the course of the year, and we're obviously keeping a close eye on that. Of course, that could create challenges for some of the core businesses, like capital markets and trading, but Goldman Sachs has been known to make money from volatility in the past. Shanali Basic, Bloomberg, New York. Shanali there at Goldman's Investor Day in New York. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First word news, here is Leanne Gerens. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. At least 36 people have died in a train crash in northeastern Greece. The collision took place in the Tempe Valley when a passenger train traveling from Athens to Thessaloniki collided with a freight service. The train operator says 350 people were on board. Rescue operations are continuing in what officials are calling very difficult conditions. Bola Tinubu has been declared the winner of Nigeria's presidential elections. The ruling party candidate and ex-governor of Lagos State won 35% of the vote, beating the main opposition party, which took 28%. Tinubu will inherit a mountain of public debt, which grew sevenfold during Mamadou Buhari's eight-year tenure. Some opposition parties claim the contest was flawed and many challenge the result in court. Now, UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has been embarking on a push to win support for his post-Brexit deal with the EU, a day after unveiling the agreement dubbed the Windsor Framework. Sunak did visit Northern Ireland in an effort to win the backing from the Democratic Unionist Party. The UK PM also addressed Conservative MPs at a meeting in Westminster. That was yesterday evening. Sunak says the deal is a unique opportunity opportunity for Northern Ireland. India is bracing for a sweltering weather already suffering its hottest February since 1901. Its weather office says there's an enhanced probability of heat waves in most parts of the country and that's over the next three months. The extreme weather poses a threat to wheat crops which were forecast to actually reach a record this year. Global News powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens and this is Bloomberg of Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Coming up, we'll be hearing from Atomico co-founder and now managing partner of Moonfire Ventures. Matthias Lundman will be talking all things venture capital, AI tech and much, much more. That's a little bit later today. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, strong China manufacturing data has pushed oil prices higher this morning. WTI posted its fourth straight month of losses in February. Now, here with me to dive into the commodity space, Jeff Curry, Goldman Sachs Global Head of Commodities Research. Jeff, I'm so happy to have you in the studio. We took like months to arrange this. Yeah. And then you sat down and you said, oh, the commodity space is a little bit more boring than usual. Is it? So much can happen. It is for the very short period and I think this manufacturing data coming out of China is some of those green shoots we need yeah. to see to get the bull story um, ramped back up again. Um, in the current environment we have oil inventories beginning to draw in June of this year yep. and then uh, metal inventories drawing a little bit sooner April May. 
but you need the micro to start to perform right. with right. inventory draws. And then you also have to be pretty comfortable that the macro gives you the green light again in the sense that there's a lot of fear of a strong dollar or a repeat of what we saw last year. So people become comfortable that you're not going to get the repeat of last year, which our base case is no, that core CPI will moderate. The Fed's not going to have to go on another rampage again. But moderates to what? Does it moderate to 4% or does it actually touch 3%? Because to get to 4 to 2%, they, they have to slam the economy. For, for, for our view right now, yeah. we just need it to keep going. Just going down. Yeah, fine. And because I think for the one thing I learned last year, to be long commodities, you need money su supply stable to growing. When money supply is going straight down, oh, it's hard to be long commodities. Um, so our base case is, hey, you get stable money supply, then you get the draw in the inventories, and that's going to be the recipe to get you know, a much stronger finish to the year. I, I, I do want to go back that at the beginning of this year, our view was it was going to be a repeat of 07, meaning cooling U.S., mm -hmm. resurgent China, and a recovering yeah. Europe. You get those three together, that is like the Goldilocks scenario for commodities because you get a weak dollar that gives you a tailwind against the oh. strong Chinese fundamentals. And that's I what, 50-50 that we get that? Uh, now I think it's 2017. <laughs> it's a it's a tuned down version of it. Um, you know our, our our returns for commodities at the beginning of the year was 43 percent. Now it's okay. 31. And actually in 2017 you got 30 percent. And it was kind of a similar scenario. A U.S. that was bouncing in and out of growth and non-growth. A Fed threatening to raise rates. And then you had China and Europe power ahead at the end of that year. And that's what really drove commodities. Um, Jeff, you gave me an epic interview in the middle. I think it was in the middle of lockdown. Where mm -hmm. you know, with very Italian hands, obviously said we're running out of everything, which is very true. Has COVID and actually the war in Ukraine changed the commodity complex forever? I'm not going to say forever, but is the situation tighter today than when we did that interview? Absolutely, yes. The big event last year was not Russia; um, it was China. I mean, you've, global oil demand contracted 2% in the fourth quarter of last year. That's a recession in my book. And that, that created the spare capacity in oil, metals, and everything. And that manufacturing data that came out this morning says we're starting to reverse that. So you can think about we created new supply not through investment but through China contracting through lockdowns. Now as China comes back, we're going to lose that, that, that spare capacity and we're going to be back to the same problems we have before but even much worse because we haven't invested so what oil at you know thirty dollars more than here I mean our, 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 our base case is you know we get into the fourth quarter towards the end of the year we get back above hundred but that a lot can change if you start getting the momentum mm -hmm. the other thing too again the investor participation in this space is really low no. so um, you know you haven't had me on here in quite some time because clients are not interested in the space like they were six, 12 months ago. And as they get interested in the space again, then you get capital flows coming back in. It'll help them likely push the market higher. I mean, we don't really talk about peak oil anymore. Is that because it's been pushed back or because we're uncertain because we're going back to more fossil fuel usage? Um, Actually, I heard the term peak oil applied to supply recently again. <laughs> um, but but I, I, I think that, that um, you know, the fact of the matter is that there's a lot of concerns around the inability to meet supply in places like um, you know, Europe and particularly right. on right. the gas side, such that the energy security question is right back up there. And so energy security, reliability, affordability of energy are now all back on, on, the, on the agenda. Um, but I think your point that you know, peak oil is not a, a mainstay, I think at this point, the the ability to get from one year to the next, given how scarce supply is, is really the focus. And the markets have been trading that way. By the way, a commodity super cycle is not an upward trend in prices. It's a sequence of spikes. And we're coming off the backside of one spike. I'm, you know, my confidence that we'll see another spike in the next 12 to 18 months is quite high. And then it'll change the public debate and we'll move. I think what happens is we saw it in gas in coal this last year. Yeah. The upcoming one's likely to be in oil. Um, I always love to talk to you, of course, about commodities, but also about crypto. I mean, mm -hmm. does the implosion in certain crypto give you vindication of what you thought all along? Well, I, I, when we look at the crypto, it, it's... I like to liken it more like any other duration asset. 
you know, unprofitable tech, tech, you know, growthy. By the way, clean energy falls within that, like, you know, green hydrogen. It's stuff that's not profitable today, but has a story way out in the future. They got crushed because of the fact that, hey, interest rates are higher, and we move into short duration, not long duration, and that killed everything that, that was long duration. Commodity, by the way, when I say commodities are boring, let's remind you, oil's <laughs> still at 85, <laughs> copper's at 9,100, uh, you know, so that the commodity space has still got good returns. Yeah. I mean, it had great returns last year, and we expect good returns this year, but that's what you expect in a high interest rate environment. Um, another way to say what what is a commodity super cycle, it's nothing other than a CapEx cycle. Look at metals prices versus global CapEx. I know, but is there a day, I mean, and I know there, there you know, like we, we had actually uh, the chief executive yesterday for an exclusive conversation. I mean, they're giving so much back to shareholders through dividends and share buybacks. Is there a danger that once again in the next 10 years they're going to be underinvested? Oh, they're, they're underinvested today. Um, is that a good thing or a bad thing if we're going through a green transition? It, it, it is a bad thing because it creates commodity shortages today. Yeah. We aren't going to get the green for 10 or 15 years from now. It's, a, it's, it's like that's long duration, oil short duration. We're not investing in the short duration stuff, only the long duration. But if we're investing, then it, it basically keeps fossil fuels alive for longer. I mean, it's, a, it's almost like a philosophical but, 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 debate. But, but, what do you but, do but, as a chief But executive? let me point this out. By not investing in, in natural gas, we ended up with higher emissions today. Yes. And the reason why is because what do low-income households do? They turn to the lowest yeah. cost, shortest yeah. cycle fuel, which is wood and coal. And let me remind you, wood emits five times what coal does, and coal emits two times what gas does. So this is a strategic policy mistake in the making that we did over the last 10 years. Are we doing the same for the next 10 years? We'll see what happens when we start to see high commodity prices again. I, I, I think when we look at the lack of investment in the space, it's not because of ESG concerns. It's because it's a history of bad returns. Um, I mean, let's just remember, this sector destroyed more wealth than any other sector known to mankind. I mean, the, the, the U.S. E&P sector destroyed 54 cents on every dollar over the previous 10 years. That's a big reason why they aren't getting money. Second reason, we were 130 about, you know, 11 months ago, and we were 78 the other day. That volatility is unacceptable for, for most investors. Um, and then a third I would put is ESG. But I was asking a, a you know, a, a, a CIO recently, been in the business forever, and she said to me, she goes, People will buy commodities the day that the three-year moving average of the Sharpe ratio exceeds that of the NASDAQ and everything else, because then they'll go, hey, okay. we're behind this. And we're, we're probably sometime in the next 12 to 18 months of hitting that. Okay, that's a great chart. I'm going to get it up, I hope, in the next hour. And then, Jeff Curry, you have to come back. Jeff Curry, great. Goldman Sachs, Global Head of Commodities, with a robust conversation of the commodity complex. Coming up, Rishi Sunak playing the waiting game while Northern Ireland's DUP studies his new post-Brexit trade deal. But investors are playing close attention as well, so we find out why next, and this is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, U.S. businesses could be set to invest billions of dollars into Northern Ireland if the deal on post Brexit trading arrangements brings political stability to the region. Well, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak hailed what he called Northern Ireland's, quote, unique access to markets. Northern Ireland is in the unbelievably special position, unique position in the entire world, European continent in having privileged access, not just to the UK home market, which is enormous, fifth biggest in the world, but also the European Union single market. If you guys get this sorted, then we want to invest in Northern Ireland because nowhere else does that exist. That's like the world's most exciting economic zone. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Bloomberg's UK correspondent, Lizzie Burden. Lizzie, great to have you on the program. So what are economists saying about the Windsor framework? 
I, I, I'm still baffled by Rishi Sunak there pointing out the privileged position of being in both the single He's raring to go. He's like, guys, this is great. If only we'd realised this in 2016. Um, the Economist are debating this furiously, the economic impact of the Windsor framework. We spoke to Karen Ward, Cherry Hunt, the te Chancellor's uh, economic advisor, about this. And she said that it's going to reduce uncertainty, boost business investment and boost growth. And Rishi Sunak himself has been touting the economic benefits of the deal. Um, but actually, there was a note from James Smith at ING yesterday where he pointed out that, according to Bank of England survey data, actually business isn't the big reason why people aren't, businesses aren't investing and their decisions will be more steered by energy prices as things move forward. So what does it mean going forward? Like, when does this actually get passed through? Do we know that the unionists are behind the deal? <laughs> uh, well, we're still waiting for their legal eagles to comb through the text and the European Research Group of Tory Brexit has hired a team to do that. Um, we might get more clues at Prime Minister's questions later today, any questions from ERG members or DUP members put to the Prime Minister later, but a carrot that he might dangle is on this investment question. Scoop on the terminal from Alex Wickham and Ellen Milligan today uh, saying that there's billions ready to invest in Northern Ireland from America uh, if they can get a deal over the line. It reminds me of Bill Clinton in the run-up to the Good Friday Agreement, trying to use business investment as an incentive to get a deal on the table. Lizzie, thank you so much. Lizzie Burden there with the very latest on the deal. Now, we'll also be covering all things UK every week on Thursdays at 9.30 a.m. UK time in our half an hour special. Coming up, but we'll be hearing from managing partner and founder of Moonfire Ventures, Matthias Lundman. We'll have a conversation on all things venture capital, AI, tech, and much more. This is Bloomberg. Chinese manufacturing activity rises by the most in over a decade, spurring a rally in stocks and commodities. Bloomberg understands that U.S. businesses are poised to invest billions of dollars into Northern Ireland if the British Prime Minister is able to gain political support for his new Brexit deal with the EU. Plus, results are in for Nigeria. The ruling party's Bola Tinubu is declared winner in the presidential election amid opposition protests. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Moonfire Ventures describes itself as the next generation venture capital fund focused on opportunities in Europe. The fund is especially keen on investments that utilize AI to transform healthcare, fintech, and gaming. Well, joining us now is Moonfire Ventures founder and managing partner, Matthias Lum. Matthias, thank you so much for coming in. You always make me start, you know, smarter uh, on some of these, like, quirky AI consequences, yeah. but now AI is all anyone is talking about. Yes. What does it change in terms of, first of all, how easy it is for you to find deals, but also the perception of AI going forward? Yeah, so it's interesting, you know, like everybody's obviously very excited about what's happening. Uh, in, excited in or scared? Depends well, on who you speak I, to. I, I agree, I agree. So it's a little <laughs> bit of both. And it will change our world and it is changing uh, our industries across the board. I would say what we're looking at right now is very kind of similar to what happened uh, in the sort of change from one, uh, Web 1.0 to mobile. Um, so it is a big transformation that we're looking at of moving into this world of AI. But it's not like it's something new. You know, like the work that we've been doing in this space has been happening since the 1970s, right? And so the 80s and 90s, great fundamental work was happening. You know, people like Jeff Hinton, Joshua Bengio, who was doing amazing yeah. things. Um, uh, but what really has made it come into the consciousness, I think, and why everybody's getting so excited is because really what chat GPT-3 was able to do and in you know, five yeah. days, a million people started using this. And so then everybody got quite excited to say, hey, look, how can this change my product? How can yeah. I look at the world a little yeah. bit differently? Uh, but what I would say, it is very much an incremental improvement. And there's actually three things that make that, make that happen, which I'm happy to talk about. Yeah, and I was going to ask you, I mean, yeah. first of all, because we speak to Wall Street bankers, yeah. and for the moment, they've banned it. So is there, is there a part of the business that it won't disrupt? Even if you look at how you know, we look at advertising, yeah. and you go on a website, and you search for something, if yeah. we start all using this kind of AI like chat GPT, then they need to rethink their models. Yeah, I do. I mean, look, I think you're right. I think we have to also slow down a little bit, you know, in terms of, like I said, yeah. this has been incremental. It's happening change by change. And, and we need to make these models stronger and stronger. And that's hard to do. And there's a lot of science required to get there, even to get even further. But what it's done today, it's already enhanced a lot. And let you say, everybody, you know, people are using it all over the place. 
But I think at the end of the day, you need to be good at what you do yeah. <laughs> yeah. to be able to use that technology in the right, right way. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Does it change as a consumer? And, and I want to go into your three points and, and yeah. your industries that you're looking at. But yeah. as a consumer, do I have a very different experience with how I buy things, I look at things, I even see my GP because of something like this? Well, look, it's already happening. When I jump on and watch Netflix, you know, I get choices. Those choices are made by machine learning. Yeah. The same thing with Amazon. I get choices. They're predicting what I might like. Now. I don't always like those choices at the moment, by the way. Like, I don't think they're always doing a good <laughs> Me job. Me too. I thought I was the only one. I was like, wait, who are they, who are they looking to? Like, what's the algorithm? Exactly. And they're like, what do they think of me? Because sometimes I'm like, <laughs> really? Um, but anyhow, so, but, those, uh, but they're going to get better and better. And when they do, so it's a bit like, you know, they make a perfect cup of coffee three out of yeah. four times. Once they make a perfect cup of coffee closer to four out of four times, it's yeah. magic. And I think that's what's going to change things for consumers. And that's mm -hmm. why founders today and people building tech businesses are like, okay, this actually might materially change my relationship with my consumer. Okay, so what are you looking at? I mean, your three things, they're basically three industries that you're looking yeah. at and how that will change yeah. them. But I would also say before that, though, there's also, I believe, three things that really need to progress in terms of science. So the first one is we need to continue to improve these algorithms. That's really, really hard. That takes time. And that's you're, just data, right? It's data and chips. Well, so yeah, so there's, there's, there's components of that. So the next part is compute, right, which is really, like you say, the, the chips and the hardware, but also the software, the cloud, you know, in terms of that working well. And if we don't make progress on the hardware, we're not going to be able to make the progress that we want in terms of achieving that per perfection. And then there's data, and there's also people wanting to uh, or, or letting you have access to data. So governments are regulating. Of course, you can't have access to everything. And then there's companies that might start doing it. And so data is the new oil, and they're like, right. hey, hold on a minute. You can't use my data. So those are the things that are inhibiting it. But to me, just to give an example, you know, uh, us ourselves, Moonfire, we're using this. We have four machine learning engineers. That's what we're founded on. We yeah. are data-driven VC, and then we're using these models to help us find and look and help our portfolio companies, and, and uh, that's really, really exciting to us. But also, if we look at uh, some of our companies, you know, we have this one company, Electric Noir, uh, super exciting business, working as sort of mobile uh, entertainment, gaming yeah. entertainment business, and the cost of their production has just dr dr up, dropped, <laughs> dropped dramatically. So you think of a Netflix, you know, one episode maybe can cost $8 million. They're building a whole series for $12,000. Then they deploy. So how does that happen exactly? Well, so sorry. And then they deploy uh, the, the technology, and it goes down to like a few dollars. Right. So essentially, the creative aspect of what they're doing um, is is becoming so much cheaper, and so they're utilizing all of these different technologies to produce what their new series, which is dark mode, and it was it was done by them. And 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 for them, they said it was it was faster, it yeah. was cheaper, and the final thing is it was better. They thought it was actually scarier than they would have done themselves. Is there anything that this will not disrupt? And I don't know what we, you know what that means, but the you know we also spoke to DeepMind. Yeah. This is going to to change so the way we look at biochemistry. Yeah. I mean, everything is changing because of AI. Yes. What happens to emotional intelligence actually between humans? Well, that's what I'm saying too. Like I think human beings are working together with technology. I think we have to you know we have to understand that that the that you're still going to need that human input and. Um, the fact is also the technology is making us think better. We're making us smarter and look at angles that we didn't think of exactly yeah. like they said. It made, for, for, for Electric Noir, it made their product better. So they came with outcomes that they wouldn't have thought of yeah. themselves. So I do think it is pretty broadly based, to be honest. I think every right. industry is going to have a component of it, right. just like the internet has right. had, just like mobile has had. Yes, it will. Will it create better quality jobs? I think so. Because sometimes we have this monotonous work that we don't want yeah. to do. So for Especially if you're a junior banker. <laughs> but even if you're working in, in, in science, you know, or you're working in, in healthcare and you're, you know, reviewing images. But, you know, we know that machines can do this very fast. They can do it 24-7. And actually, they can probably narrow it down. And so you're like, okay, well, these, these are the ones that I really need to look at. And these are the ones I need to spend time. And I need to be thinking about things that are really important. So you can spend the time doing that rather than feeling rushed trying to get things done that are very manual and boring. Um, so Matias, what does it actually mean for some of the companies that you're trying to, to invest in? Yeah. So there's gaming. Is there, is there some, are there opportunities actually in this, given your, your four engineers and algorithms? Like yeah, that? yeah, no. So the, the, for us, you know, uh, we're able to see a lot more companies in terms of that we review. We look at over 2 million companies uh, per year. That's not possible with eight people and two people uh, who are sort of on the investment side. Mm -hmm. So we can do a lot more work, and then we can actually help our companies a lot more because we can actually provide them with data and information uh, that we pull from, the, from, uh, from everywhere in terms of giving them insights in terms of what they should be doing. 
But similarly, our companies are doing the same thing yeah. and creating right. magical product, products. Do, do you, and, and this is very Bloomberg, we also love data and we analyze data and that's yes. really all we do, but is, is there is any you know, point where you meet a founder and you say the data is telling me that this is not going to work? But I think it will. And if you look at how, you know, a lot of the big ones got started, whether it be luxury or Facebook. Absolutely. At the time, it didn't make sense. But how do you override the machine learning? Well, well so that's the other thing. Like for us, it's not like the machine's making the decision. We're making the decision. We're, they're, they're helping us, helping us become better. They're making us more bionic. But at the end of the day, it's the human mind that makes the ultimate decisions. And so they go just so far. But the thing is, what, what we're doing is we're not necessarily doing sharpshooting in terms of our yeah. technology finding the exact solution. What we're doing is, let's say there's a forest and we're getting rid of a lot of the trees. And we're focusing on the ones that, okay, those are the ones we should be paying attention on. Yeah. Because that's the hard thing in this world. As you know, we have so much information, so much data out there, and we get lost in it. And so th the work, again, that, that uh, this world does is help you to auto-summarize a lot mm -hmm. of things. And uh, that, that's really powerful. Um, in gaming, does it change the way that it can grow? So, I mean, are we looking at multiples, basically in terms of revenue, but also the growth of the market yeah. because of the powerful AI behind it? Well, I think that gaming is one of those few markets that keeps on growing. So it is already huge. And it will become the main form of uh, uh, sort of uh, media entertainment. But yes, what is really, really cool is that now that you basically potentially content production is reduced dramatically, uh, you know, maybe by 99%, um, you can actually have infinite content. Right. And so you can suddenly create right. worlds. Um, so it's, it's extraordinary, the, you know, the changes that are happening. Matthias, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Matthias Lungman there, uh, Moonfire Ventures and Managing Partner and Founder, joining us on, well, venture capitalism and tech. Now, coming up next, we're joined by Toka Muna, JP Morgan's head of EMEA ESG and Green Economy Investment Bank. And we'll discuss the challenges facing the green tech pivot. Catch that exclusive interview next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition of Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the transition to a green, low-carbon economy will require a big pivot from investors towards green, green, clean and green technologies. JP Morgan's Clean Tech Stars Conference in London is trying to facilitate that switch. Now, the event is focused on supporting and scaling up private high-growth companies. Well, joining us now for an exclusive conversation is Chuck Muna, JP Morgan's head of EMEA, ESG, and Green Economy Investment Banking. Chaka, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. When you look at the two current, actually, trends in deploying capital and green, you have the GOP in the U.S. pushing back, and then you have the IRA uh, really trying to go for, for green technologies. Which one of these trends will prevail in the end? Well, I think ultimately we have a big challenge as society to reconfigure the way that our economies are operating towards a net zero world. And the companies that we've brought together, we've got over 30 companies that have raised in aggregate around $7 billion over the last few years and are going on to the next chapter in their journey of development, are absolutely going to be key to that. They straddle all the different green economy verticals, not just low carbon energy, carbon capture and storage, but also sustainable food, alternative proteins, fusion, and so forth. And that's all going to be fundamental because although obviously funding this Francine is absolutely crucial, which is where a bank like JP Morgan comes in and we're committed to um, financing and facilitating two and a half trillion dollars through to 2030 to deliver against yeah. the UN sustainable development goals. But we need this technology. So we've got the technology at the moment that will get us on a path to a net zero world by 2030. But it, from 2030 to 2050, you know, the final straight, as it were, some of that technology hasn't even been invented yet. Yeah. So that's the challenge that we've got. So people can have, yeah, you know, there'll be short term political arguments around these things, of course. Yeah. But actually, the bigger existential challenge we have as a society is right in front of us. And these companies are absolutely key to meeting that challenge. But how does it impact, I guess, you know, Wall Street's firm's narrative about green investing? And actually, how does the IRA impact JP Morgan specifically? Well, I think the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act overall is a very welcome development. And we're already seeing a lot more 
uh, plans coming forward to invest in the various different green economy verticals, obviously, particularly in the United States. Now, other p blocks like the European Union, for example, are working out uh, what they've got in place, the package of support and measures for their businesses here. Is there a gap between what the US has put in place and what they've got in place and how do they fill yeah. that? Now, given that, you know, it's quite challenging because of the risk profile of some of these early stage companies to raise funding, clearly um, the public sector governments are going to have a role. And if the US Inflation Reduction Act is going to help kind of spur that kind of investment, then that is a, a, yeah. a good thing. I mean, it's quite interesting, actually, when you look at what's happening in the private market. So the companies that we've brought together today, this is all private capital because there has been a gap between where greenhouse gas emissions have been coming from and certainly in yeah. the venture private capital space where the money has been going. So those sectors that make up 85% of greenhouse gas emissions in 2021 attracted around 39% of climate but, tech investment. That's gone up. So that's now around 40% um, uh, uh, in 2022 yeah. and we hope will be higher in 2023. So there, there are challenges here. But in spite of market conditions, there's a lot of interest from investors in this space. And, and when you look at, of course, the company that you, you know, the companies that you convened, what do they tell you about European efforts to make up for the Inflation Reduction Act? Is there anything in Europe that actually they, they tell you is a good thing and could, you know, I guess, temper some of the the the, the lack of Europe being as as forceful than the U.S. on this? Well, I think I think the first thing is that we still need to see the detail of the implementation of the US Inflation Reduction Act. And so there is no doubt that um, EU domiciled companies are looking closely at what's on offer there. Definitely what they hear sounds attractive, but the detail is going to be very important. I think from the point of view particularly of the EU, at the moment there is this audit mm -hmm. process going on to see what is already in place. And actually, the EU with the Fit for 55 package, um, the, um, uh, the, U U the EU uh, um, green industry, industrial strategy um, at their bringing about, these things are already providing support. And they're working out, well, what is not there that might be provided in the US Inflation Reduction Act? But of course, in the short term, one of the easiest measures to implement is relaxing, which they are doing temporarily, the, the, the EU state aid rules to um, mm -hmm. facilitate better fiscal support here. Um, and I think in, at, at the end of the day, that is what companies in Europe will be looking at is what are you going yeah. to do? What's, what's it going to look like? And at the moment, that's not entirely clear. Chaka, as always, thank you so much for joining us on Bloomberg. Chaka Muna there, JP Morgan's head. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. ESG and Green Economy Investment Banking. Now, coming up, we'll have plenty more on some breaking news, including Uniper. So Uniper has, we understand, a new chief executive. This is a, a, a huge energy giant, of course, that has had its fair share of trials and tribulations. Um, they have named Michael Lewis as a new chief executive. This is Swedish, Sweden's biggest um, of course, w w one of the biggest Nordic nuclear plants. Now, Santander pledged to return a bigger share of earnings to investors as they joined the race with other European lenders to lure shareholders after years of subpar returns. Now, Spain's largest lender plans to pay out 50% of profits over the next three years. It's also announced a buyback program and new financial targets. While Santander executive chair Anna Botin said she expects the bank's valuation to improve, as interest rates rise and the lender pledges to return a bigger share of profit to investors. Well, she spoke to us in an exclusive conversation. Success is delivering on what you commit. And we delivered on the 2019 Investor Day plans in spite of COVID, the war in Ukraine, now inflation. And this is really important. And so that gives us a huge confidence that the model works that our customer focus in market and global scale and diversification actually are providing good returns for shareholders. And this is an acceleration of that delivery. And this is really what matters in what we said today. And how much of this is thanks to rising interest rates because of the European Central Bank and the global economy? And how much of this is delivery on strategy? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so more, I would say that today, more than half is actually because we are improving every year and we're going to do much more in the next few years, improving our operating model. And the, uh, some of it is, of course, tailwinds. You know, it's not healthy to have an economy with negative interest rates. If you're a saver and you get nothing, and European banks did not charge you, and we're a retail commercial bank, so we suffered more than most. And we're giving mortgages out at 
10 basis points. That was a year ago. And so, yes, some of it is tailwinds, yes, uh, but it's a normalization of interest rates. It's a normalization of how the system should work. And more than half is what we are actually delivering in terms of a better operating model. Are you confident overall about the economy, the world economy? I know you were confident four weeks ago um, when we spoke to you on earnings. Yes. It, are things actually even looking better than they were back then? Well, I've been saying this for months, not just last week. I, I've been saying that the strength of demand is, 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 is so high. Uh, and the key number for us as a retail commercial bank is employment. And we are continuing to see very strong employment. Now, that's going to change. How fast? I don't know. Uh, you know, there is not a painless way of cutting inflation. <laughs> and so the question is how high a price you pay. And we have a lot of experience in managing in inflation countries, not just now, but for, for years. And so the sooner you cut inflation, the better. But you do have to take some pain. Our interview with the Santander Executive Chair, Anna Boutin. Coming up, we'll dive deeper in the Nigerian election results and what it means for Africa's biggest economy. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Bola Tinubu has won Nigeria's presidential election. The ruling party candidate and ex-governor of Lagos State won 35% of the vote, beating the main opposition party, which took 28%. However, the result may be challenged in court, with some opposition parties claiming that the contest was flawed. Well, Bloomberg's Jennifer Zabazaja just came back from Lagos, Nigeria, and she joins us with the very latest. First of all, Jen, good morning. Great work and great reporting there on the ground. So what did you learn? First of all, this is contested. Yeah. Like, what happens next? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest question is going to be what these opposition parties do. Yesterday, uh, on Tuesday, we did hear from them, and they were already protesting the results as it stood. Um, and so they have 21 days now to really see uh, and go to court and, and file um, whether or not they are going to appeal this ruling. And what we heard from Bola Tinubu, who is the president-elect at this point in time, um, he said, you know, in his mind it was a free and fair election, but is, was encouraging people to go to court if they are going to dispute this election result um, and yeah. not take it to the streets at this point. I mean, are, are there worries that actually this turns into violent demonstrations? There, there could be. And it's because I think when you when you look at Nigeria as a whole, there's a lot of frustrations on the ground. Yeah. There's a lot of issues with the local currency, with the gas, um, with the, the economy as a whole, with unemployment, and with a lot of young people. And just going back to the president-elect, he appealed to the young people this morning when he accepted uh, the, the, um, the presidency. Um, he said, I want you to be with me. But what we did hear um, from the Labour Party candidate, uh, Peter Obi, was that he was actually galvanizing a lot of young people. So there's a lot of frustration on the ground uh, that it's, it's sort of business as usual, especially considering the turmoil that we've seen over the past few years in Nigeria. Um, the ruling party is, is again uh, going to be leading this economy. So does the ruling party and the new president like can he fix the economy given his mandate yeah. and does, but does that also just need to wait and, until the, the the election is settled well a, a lot of investors based on sort of the market reaction we're seeing is are, are hoping that he's able to do something at least in the short yeah. term to some of these reforms um in particular fuel subsidies uh, which have cost the uh, economy a, a, a much of their revenue <laughs> and so he's really hoping or the the Excuse me. The uh, investment com community is really hoping that he can come in, uh, but he's going to have to yeah. unify. Yeah, he's going to have to unify these parties, unify the country uh, to move forward. Jen, thank you so much. Jennifer Sabazaja there with the very latest on Nigeria. Don't forget, we'll also be hearing a little bit later on. I'm looking forward to this interview. The Bundesbank president, Joachim Nagel. That interview, 1.30 p.m. London time, 8.30 a.m. in New York. And this is Bloomberg. U.S. companies in China, frankly, are exhausted after three years of COVID zero. The economy, in many ways, remains under pressure, especially the Chinese consumer. I think the new government coming in, they may need some time to figure out how to run this big machine. The majority of companies say they're going to stay in China. 
uh, but they are challenged. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards and Matt Miller. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. China bounces back. New economic data shows signs of a stronger recovery following the end of COVID-0 restrictions. In Nigeria, the ruling party's candidate has been declared the winner of the presidential election. Uh, Bola Tinubu will face a deepening fiscal crisis and widespread shortages of foreign currency and gasoline. And investors aren't buying what Goldman Sachs is selling. Shares fell after Goldman executives offered a glossy portrait of the firm's prospects. Questions remain about the troubled consumer unit. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. Matt, a lot to talk about from the micro to the macro. But starting with the macro, the China picture, uh, incredible return, resurgence of growth, it seems, there ahead of ISM out of the U.S. later. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yesterday we were worried about Xi's leadership in which way uh, he was going to take the country. Today it looks like the country is doing just fine, and that's helping futures to rise um, here in the U.S. We're looking at only slight gains, about two-tenths of 1% after the slight drop, drop about um, the same amount that we saw yesterday in the last trading day of February. Of course, today we're kicking off uh, March, so at least we're getting off on a, a, the right foot here. We do see the U.S. 10-year yield rising, but again, it's exactly the same level as it was 24 hours ago. So there's been a little bit of roller coaster action. It was up and back down. Um, now we're gaining three basis points, but still at 394.94, so um, just shy of 4%. A little bit of a tailwind in terms of the dollar coming off about four tenths of 1%. We're at 1249. We had been around 1253, um, but we're still over 100 points shy of the peak. And maybe bets that the dollar is going to weaken our start are going to start to make uh, money today. They've been wrong for, um, uh, well, most of the month. Bitcoin itself uh, up 2.6%, but still under 24,000. So 23,757. It's been a little bit lackluster in the trade after it approached 25,000 and has now uh, come back uh, down a bit. But with dollar weakness, you often tend to get Bitcoin strength as well as uh, with futures uh, strength. Let's take a look at what's going on in Asia because that's where the China data really shines, as you might expect. Um, the overall index, the broader index, up one and a half percent, but the Hang Seng gaining more than four percent in uh, today's session or uh, overnight, and it's pretty, uh, pretty uh, remarkable strength leading through to a weaker dollar, a stronger yuan. You see that here in the uh, CNH, the offshore trade, and then the dollar also weaker against the Japanese yen. Right now, you can buy 130, uh, 135.86 in terms of uh, dollars to yen. What do you see in Europe? Yeah, right. The uh, picture in Europe then certainly being supported by what we saw in China. A big question, how much does that China strength read across into Europe and the U.S. and the global narrative? Well, it's interesting that we did see a bit of a pickup from a negative futures picture here for Europe and in the U.S. actually on the back of that China data. So although we're not, uh, you know, uh, running away with ourselves with enthusiasm for the China data and some people saw this coming, it does, you do get a sense that perhaps it is underpinning the gains and offsetting, managing to offset some of the concerns around higher interest rates. So we're kind of half and half in terms of Sectors going higher, sectors going lower here in Europe. But overall, markets are going a little bit higher this morning. One sector that really loved what we had out of China, that was basic resources. So this plays well for London, up by just shy of 3% on the basic resources equities sector. All Funds Group, this is an investment platform business, and they were the subject of a potential takeover offer from Euronext. Well, Euronext has pulled that, and as a result, the stock down by 13.4%. The euro is up, by, uh, is, is up this morning, up by 7 tenths of 1%. It's a broader dollar weakness story. With risk on in other assets, we see dollar sell and that is playing well for the yen, the pound, the euro, all kinds of things, uh, in particular the Chinese currency, going higher against the US dollar. But there's also a European concern around inflation here. Also worth noting that we've seen Italy forced to revise up its 2020, 21 and 2022 deficit estimates. I was just checking whether that had done anything to uh, the Italian BTP market. Didn't seem to be moving it too much, but we'll keep an eye on that. Broadly speaking, we're seeing the euro going higher and we're seeing yields going higher. We had already seen the Italian yield story pushing higher, along with France, along with Germany. After we got the French and the Spanish data yesterday on inflation, those came in hot. North Rhine-Westphalia came in hot today. The rest of Germany looks a little bit more mixed. Uh, but we certainly see some yield pressure continuing here for European markets then, Matt.
All right, well, we, we are getting headlines across from the Bundesbank right now. I just want to bring you these ahead of our interview later on today with Joachim Nagel. He said that he supports a more rapid reversal of the European Central Bank's bond buying to help tackle inflation. He said after the step that looks necessary um, uh, for March, uh, further significant interest rate steps might be necessary afterwards as well. So uh, we're going to bring you Maria Tadeo. She is live at the German uh, Central Bank um, and, uh, of course, Nagel's comments um, about what the ECB does, the broader European Central Bank. We're going to hear uh, from him in an interview later on today as well. Let's get back, though, to China. The economy there is showing signs of a stronger rebound after COVID restrictions were abandoned. Manufacturing posted its biggest improvement in more than a decade last month. For more, we're joined now by Bloomberg's chief Asia economics correspondent, Enda Curran. So, Enda, what can we uh, read from this and, and how, um, how much can we read into these numbers? Are they legit? Well, it's the first kind of decent reading we're getting on the post-COVID Chinese economy, and it's a good set of numbers pretty much across the board. Matt, PMI coming in 52.6, like you mentioned there, strongest in over 10 odd years. Strength across the board within the components, manufacturing, employment increasing, services coming back on the back of a rebound of consumer, that's to be expected. But the industrial side of it showing improvement too, better than expected in fact. Uh, and that's hinting at a rebalancing of the recovery in China's economy. We also had, by the way, data on the housing market today showing home sales increasing for the first time since back around mid-2021. So when you take it all together, it suggests that China's economy is recovering at a faster clip than anticipated. It's actually rebounding at a faster clip than it did back after the original lockdown in 2020. And it's certainly setting good mood music for the officials when they gather in Beijing from Sunday onwards for the National People's Congress that will basically set out economic uh, policy for the rest of the year. So yes, question marks obviously always around the uh, transparency around his data and of course how long this rebound will last. But for now at least, it suggests that the reopening has been positive. Yeah, absolutely. So a really interesting take on what reopening has done to the economy. And this will no doubt feature as part of the National People's Congress meetings that are set to take place over the weekend and beyond then, Ender. Any clues in this data for what we should expect from the MPC? Well, it's as good a mood, mood, mood music as they could have asked for going into it. And a, a, a lot of economists are expecting the officials to set a target of around at least 5%, if not higher. Uh, the messaging from the official sector has been all about growth in the economy this year, support for the economy. There's no hint of pulling back on that. That seems to be their focus. There is, There are other agendas going on, of course, in terms of a, a, an ongoing consolidation of power uh, under President Xi Jinping, but the overall narrative is one of support for the economy. It's expected to be a better year, and that's probably going to be the message coming out of the National People's Congress during next week. Enda, uh, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Enda Curran with the latest on China. So that ripples through global markets. Let's get to some politics. Uh, Bola Tinubu has won Nigeria's presidential election. The ruling All Progressives Congress Party uh, got over 35% of the vote, with Tinubu set to inherit $167 billion worth of public debt when he takes over in late May. However, the election uh, result may be challenged in court, with some opposition parties claiming the contest was in some way flawed. Bloomberg's Africa correspondent, Sir Jennifer Sabbath, Saja has just returned from Lagos and she joins us now here on set in London. Jen, we saw you there in Lagos covering these events. These results have been many days coming. Break down the results for us. Yeah, Anna, I think the biggest thing to note at this point in time that this has really been the most competitive race that we have seen in terms of the presidency since the introduction of multi-party democracy in Nigeria back in 1999. So the fact that we did see the ruling party, the APC, win this election or be declared as the, the victor, um, we did also see two very close races between uh, the introduction of the Labour Party, which was Peter Obi, who you can see there, uh, put up a pretty good race. And what we heard from these two opposing uh, the opposition parties uh, is that they didn't feel that this was a legitimate race. They didn't feel like the counting uh, was fair uh, and they might uh, take it to court, as you mentioned. But significant in that this was really the first time we saw this competition. Also significant that we saw voter turnout really low, the lowest in a, a number of years. So a lot of things that people are pointing which to is at this nuts. point in time. How is that possible, Jen, considering all the problems um, Nigerians face? We heard uh, that they had difficulty removing any kind of cash from their own bank accounts. Wouldn't that push them out to the polls to vote for anyone else than who was incumbent? 
I mean, you would think so, Matt. I mean, I think that's a fair assessment. But uh, on the flip side, uh, that also caused a lot of frustration uh, for people even getting to the polls. I mean, being there on the ground, there was no cash, not enough cash for people to even, you know, pay for gas if there was gas uh, to get to the polls. And so the fact that there were 93 million registered voters, only 87 million people actually picked up their ballots. Uh, but based on the count, it was under 30 million uh, that actually voted. And so uh, from a lot of young people's perspective, the people that I spoke to, they're frustrated uh, by this uh, government. They were frustrated and hoping to see a new regime come in uh, and step up, considering all the frustrations that they've heard. Uh, but earlier this morning, when Bola Tinubu was declared the victor, uh, he actually appealed to young people to get on board with him, despite the challenges with the currency uh, and with fuel, uh, and, and hoping that he can potentially show them a brighter future uh, for themselves. But honestly, a, a lot of promises at this point in time investment Investors are really looking to see what actually goes into practice to turn things around. All right. Incredibly important as the biggest economy in Africa. Jennifer, thanks very much for your reporting. Bloomberg's Jen Zabasaja there. She was on the ground in Lagos. Now she's back in London. Uh, let's get back to the world of finance, um, specifically banking. Goldman Sachs set out uh, to reset the narrative at its investor day yesterday, but investors weren't having it. The firm's ambitious new targets and messaging whiplash over the future of its troubled consumer business underwhelmed the market. Goldman's president and COO, John Waldron, still struck an optimistic tone. He spoke with Bloomberg Shanali Basic. I would say it was an extremely productive and valuable meeting where people walked, our partners walked out of that meeting very optimistic about the future of the firm, very optimistic about the investments we're making in the forward of the opportunity of the firm, particularly in those two market leading businesses. Shanali joins us now for more. So, of course, Goldman executives talking their book, but the street said we don't buy it and sold the shares off. Um, the biggest drop that we've seen since their disappointing quarterly results. It was actually the worst drop in the Dow, but conversely, J.P. Morgan was the biggest gainer. And I think that's important to note because a lot of the issues around Goldman has to do with the uncertainties around its consumer business. You have to hand it to management in the sense that, listen, they bought Green Sky just a couple of years ago. This was a more than $2 billion deal. It brought them in a point of sale lending, but that comes with provisionings. So what does that mean now? When they gave you the path to profitability, the path to break even for that platform solution, business, it's still two years away. And so the question is, can investors be patient through that? But they are considering all options, which means they could potentially sell a business like Green Sky, among other, other options they're considering. You know, I a do, big money losing uh, business, by the way. So they paid two billion to lose what? One point two billion a year. But the point here is, is that the consumer business has brought them a lot of deposits and there are things now in that platform solutions business like transaction banking that helps them in other places. I think what's important to look at here, we know the consumer story now. It's confusing at Goldman. There are a lot of challenges. It's a down market. But what surprised me more was that when we asked them whether this was an incremental change or Goldman Sachs 2.0, they said Goldman Sachs 2.0 is our investment in investment banking, trading and asset management. And so you can think about Goldman in those two ways very concretely. Mm. And then that leaves questions still about the consumer. Yeah, Shanali, it does leave questions still then about the consumer business. Is the consumer dream finally dead at Goldman Sachs? If it is, is it the focus on those two other parts of the business that you reference? I think that the reasons that I gave about why they had kept and focused on consumer in the first place are really important to remember here because they have not cut the whole thing off yet. They have not decided to exit the entire business. They gave a time frame. The question now after the initial stock sell off is are they going to be able to talk to investors and continue on the strategy because it gives them deposits and other things. It gives them the benefit of lending. Remember, all the consumer bank stocks last year sold off more than Goldman, but they're coming back up this year. So I think you have to wait and see a little bit, Anna, because potentially there is still some benefit to be had from things like deposits, but potentially more for high net worth clients that uh, tend to pair better with their wealth manager. Right, not the basic consumer that they seem to be courting originally. Shanali, thanks very much for joining Shanali Basak, who um, covered that extensively for us yesterday and did the interview as well. Let's get a look at some of the stocks we're following in pre-market trading this morning. There's some big movers um, with Novavax front and center. Said there's substantial doubt about its ability to stay in business at all through next year after it struggled to, to develop and sell a COVID-19 vaccine. As a result, you can see those shares in the pre-market down 24%.
Then Rivian shares slumping as well after the electric truck maker's 2023 production outlook fell short of expectations amid supply chain snags. They expect to make 50,000 uh, trucks this year. That's not as many as Wall Street analysts had anticipated. Stellantis CEO Carlos Tavares actually gave some uh, negative news yesterday, cautioning that inflation could be triggered by a shortage of battery raw materials for the electric vehicles um, that they make if the U.S. IRA requires those materials be sourced locally. Nonetheless, uh, the shares are up 3.6-3.7% uh, in the pre-market. And HP shares also rising in the pre-market after the computer company reported its first quarter results and affirmed its full-year forecast. Anna? Coming up on the program then, Matt, we'll talk to Rikaya Ibrahim at Daily Insights Strategist at BCA Research. Uh, what does she think of China? Is she focused on the challenges for China? Is she focused on the opportunities around the reopening story? And the road ahead for Tesla also in focus. Elon Musk lays out the company's master plan during today's Investor Day. He has a lot of businesses on his plate these days. Plus, the Bundesbank is out with his annual report, also giving us uh, their take on uh, the Bundesbank president, Joachim Nagel, also giving his take on... ECB policy, bond buying, he would be uh, in favour of a more rapid reversal of the ECB's bond buying programme, so further into QT more quickly, seems to be the message from Nagel. Also, uh, could see more big ECB rate hikes as being possible. Those are the lines coming through from the Bundesbank this morning. We will bring you more later this hour with Maria Tadeo, who's reporting from the Bundesbank in Frankfurt for us. And you can catch Maria's interview with the Bundesbank President Joachim Nagel at 8.30am New York time, 1.30pm in London. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Anna Edwards out in London. And we have been getting headlines across the terminal from Joachim Nagel of the Bundesbank. Of course, um, the biggest and most important uh, part of the ECB, I guess, in terms of the uh, national banks around Europe, saying that QT really needs to speed up a little bit or indicating that he believes that quantitative tightening uh, right now is expected to begin in June at a very slow pace, $15 billion a month of passive roll off. At that pace, it would take 30 years to reduce um, the ECB's $9 trillion balance sheet. Not that they necessarily want to get it down to zero, but joining us now is Noor Al Ali, Bloomberg Markets Live editor. Noor, uh, as we talk about higher and higher uh, well, more and higher rate increases, right? 50, maybe 50 again, maybe 50 again for the ECB, getting us to 4%. Uh, why don't they speed up QT um, as well? Well, I mean, if you think about it, really, Matt, it's a question of just how much can bonds handle? You know, it's, there's incredible amount of pressure already. You know, we've had the ECB raise rates aggressively, and they're saying that they're going to continue to be aggressive in their tightening cycle, mostly because they're, you know, they are fixed, excuse me, on getting their inflation target back to 2%. We know that core inflation is quite elevated. It's above 5%. Bloomberg Economics expects it even to tick higher when we get that data tomorrow. And that, to be honest, is quite a lot for traders to digest. I know we've been pricing in higher, higher rates and for longer, particularly in, in the euro dollar curves. But also now we need to consider from a, from a central bank perspective how their actions are going to impact countries on the periphery. We've seen Italy revise their deficit figures for 2002, uh, for 2020, 21 and 22 as well. So there's a lot that's going into the fray here. Okay, and Noor, good morning. I wanted to ask you about oil prices because we seem to have got stuck. I mean, low 80s to mid 80s is where we trade on Brent for recent weeks. And then we get this Chinese data that seems to at least excite uh, basic resource stocks and some commodities went higher, but oil not so much. Uh, what's going on here? Absolutely, because, you know, it, 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 China in general is the biggest buyer and, and the biggest consumer of commodity products, particularly oil as well. They used to snap up a lot of their oil products from Saudi Arabia, but when you've had the Russian sanctions come into place, you know, there's been a lot of talk on whether or not these Russian supplies that are sort of outside the complex of supplies that we know are agreed on, because now they're sanctioned by Europe, going to Indian buyers, going to Chinese buyers. The floor that's been set for oil prices have been there largely since November. We've seen 
to be honest, a range-bound trading for oil, mm -hmm. whether it's Brent or WTI, and I expect that to continue the to continue to be the pace until we get some form of catalyzation into place. We know that OPEC is meeting in June. They've said that they're not revising their output, so there's a lot that's going into that mixed outlook. No, thanks very much, Bimbez. No, Al Ali joining us there from the uh, Markets Live team. And for further market analysis, check out the Markets Live blog. MLIV Go is the f uh, the function to use on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. In northeastern Greece, at least 32 people have been killed in a train crash. Eight, uh, 85 others have been injured. Authorities say a passenger train collided with a freight train just before midnight, starting a fire. The passenger train was traveling between two popular tourist destinations, Athens and Thessaloniki. Lori Lightfoot has become the first mayor of Chicago in 40 years to lose a bid for re-election. She finished third in Tuesday's election. An April 4th runoff will pit former Chicago schools chief against the Cook County Commissioner. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. China bounces back. New economic data shows signs of a stronger recovery following the end of COVID-0 restrictions. In Nigeria, the ruling party's candidate has been declared the winner of the presidential election. Bola Tinubu will face a deepening fiscal crisis and widespread shortages of foreign currency and gasoline. And investors aren't buying what Goldman Sachs is selling. Shares fell after Goldman executives offered a glossy portrait of the firm's prospects. Questions remain, though, about the troubled consumer unit. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller in New York. And Matt, a lot to talk about when it comes to the Chinese story overnight, building our way towards U.S. manufacturing ISM print uh, later on today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the China story really is front and center. It's driving you know, local uh, equities indexes and assets a lot more than it is here, but it's trickling around the world. We see gains in uh, S&P futures now. They're slight, only three-tenths of 1%, but that offsets the losses that we saw in yesterday's cash trade. Um, so we're back at an even level. Uh, the same is true when you look at the 10-year. We were up yesterday. I saw a 396 and change at one point um, and then down. Now we're coming back up one and a half basis points, but still at 393.57. So still short of where we were this time yesterday morning. Um, the dollar index also coming down right now at 1248.56. And in a minute, you're going to see the Asian currencies against which the dollar has fallen, but that really creates a tailwind for uh, stocks. Maybe um, the first trading day of March will be a better one than the last trading day of February. Bitcoin up about two and a half percent, but still under 24,000 at 23,723. So Bitcoin coming back a little bit, but not getting as close to 25,000 as it was a few sessions ago. Take a look at what's going on in Asia. The Hang Seng Index is really where you want to focus. Oh, sorry. I always go straight to Asia uh, again in the second half as we do in the first half. But just so you know, the Hang Seng Index was up 4% overnight, <laughs> and that was the biggest gain since December of, I think, December of 2022. So um, it's been a while since we've seen that kind of gain. In terms of pre-market movers, Novavax has said they may not uh, have enough money to go on through the rest of the year, uh, next year. Um, so this uh, troubled COVID-19 um, uh, vaccine developer down 23% in the pre-market. Rivian is also taking a hit in the pre-market off 8%. The electric vehicle maker said it's going to produce 50,000 Rivians this year. That's less than Wall Street expected, and it missed uh, revenue expectations as well for the most recent quarter. Stellantis had a bunch of bad news actually out, saying that inflation is going to hit battery costs. Um, French car registrations fell 9% in change, while its crosstown rival um, at Renault had registrations up almost 20%. Nonetheless, the stock is up more than 3%, 3.5% to start uh, the pre-market trade today. And then HP up 1.6%. 
uh, out the computer maker um, saying that uh, this year could be better and uh, you know computers have had a really tough time with the PC glut uh, the chip glut there as we saw a shortage everywhere else um, so maybe a better day for HP than it has been a year Anna what do you see in terms of Europe we see that the Chinese story is working its way, as you say, into some of the global markets. Uh, we uh, have got the uh, basic resources sector, the mining sector, Matt, doing really well this morning. That's helping to cushion the negatives around Europe and the higher yield environments and the fears about higher rates. So Stocks Europe 600 up by just an eighth of a percent, though, so pairing back from earlier gains. All Funds Group, this is a, an, an investment platform business. It had been the recipient of an intended offer by Euronext. They've pulled that bid, and so as a result, the stock is down by 13.4 percent. Could there be others, though, in the works. Uh, Euro is at 106.55, up eight tenths of a percent. And Matt was rightly pointing out that we've seen weakness in the dollar. It's pretty broad based. Some of the Asian dynamics driving that as well with strengthening of the Japanese currency and the Chinese currency, crucially after that Chinese data. Uh, but this is also being driven by what's going on in Europe in terms of inflation. The French and the Spanish data of yesterday coming in pretty hot. Parts of the German story looking hot. Other parts of the German story looking uh, a little bit more uh, mixed. And we certainly build our way towards a, a fuller picture of Eurozone inflation tomorrow as we wait for that though the market reassessing its estimates of just how quickly we see tightening from the ECB or at least how long we keep tightening at the ECB and how high we get to so that is pushing the euro it is also pushing yields higher in Europe the German five-year yield on the move as you can see here 2.8 percent is where we stand right now joining us now talking of German yields talking of all things German and the fight against inflation uh, we are joined from the Bundesbank in Frankfurt by Bloomberg's Europe correspondent Maria Tadeo Maria the head of the Bundesbank Joachim Nagel was speaking a little bit earlier the hawk we the hawk we have come to know from the bundesbank seems to still be in residence what were some of the highlights Yes, Anna, you know, I came in handy. Uh, you're talking about Germany, and I am at the Bundesbank. Uh, Mr. Nagel is still uh, obviously briefing reporters, but this is the publication of their annual uh, report. And just to run you through some of the highlights that the German Central Bank has uh, put out here, when it comes to GDP, they say that in Q1, they still expect a contraction. They say for the time being, there is no pickup in the German economy. There is no signs of major improvement, and they'll have to wait, or Germany will have to wait until the back end of the year to potentially see the economy building momentum momentum. Obviously, anything to do with the German economy is important when it comes to the sentiment of the euro area because this is the biggest economy, clearly. When it comes to inflation, check the language here in this report. It says in 2022, we'll go down in Germany's economic history as a year of one of the highest inflation rates since the foundation of the Federal Republic. It's a big headache for the central bank, but as Matt knows very well, it is also a political headache. Now, they expect for this year an average rate between 6 to 7 percent and they also say, and this is interesting, that yes, energy prices have come down. That may be positive in the short term, but it may not be enough to bring down inflation on the medium term. So perhaps suggesting that some of the forces have become more entrenched when it comes to inflation. Yeah, the uh, hyperinflation entrenched in the German psyche. They feel uh, genuinely uncomfortable when it comes to inflation. We have seen uh, repricing of rates this week. The highest, I think, uh, Bund quote that uh, we've seen since, well, 15 years ago. What's the Bundesbank's take on that? Uh, yes, and, and Matt, I'm not sure if you agree, but to me it seems the side guys once again is changing uh, this week. We've seen the repression to 4%. We've seen the inflation prints coming in hotter than expected. There is an ECB decision that is coming up in about two weeks. Well, I'll be back in Frankfurt uh, for it. Now, so far, the German Central Bank seeing that it's obvious the final hike, the last hike, will not be in March. And beyond that, there may be need, or quote, a need for a significant uh, hike beyond that. Of course, whether that is an endorsement of another 50 basis points, we're going to ask Mr. Nagel himself because we'll be speaking to him in a few hours from now. Okay, I have it on good authority that Matt agrees with you, Maria, which is always nice. Uh, he also says, that it would, uh, uh, Nagel says, it would be a grave error to slow or halt tightening early. So uh, certainly something that I know Maria will pick up in her conversations with him later. You can catch Maria's interview speaking with the Bundesbank president, uh, Joachim Nagel, at 8.30 a.m. New York time, 1.30 p.m. in London. Joining us now to talk markets, Rukaya Ibrahim, Daily Insights strategist at BCA Research. Rukaya, I wanted to start with what we've heard overnight coming through from China because this did seem 
to, well, certainly uh, lit something underneath the, the Hang Seng and the Hang Seng Tech Index up by 7% at one point. And we've got a few things going on here. We've got the reopening story, of course, post-COVID, and also expectations of, of a change in politics around clamping down on some of those tech firms that was uh, so, uh, so much talked about a few years ago. What are your expectations for China and how that spreads globally? Well, I think that um, the fact that the Chinese PMI, PMI came in strong is not surprising. At the end of the day, China is reopening, economic activity is re-accelerating, and the government is uh, increasing their stimulus measures. So we shouldn't be too shocked um, that you know, activity is improving. But I think what's more important is really that I think investors are likely uh, over over uh, optimistic about the longer term outlook for the Chinese economy. Uh, you know, there are still headwinds that are facing the Chinese account economy. You mentioned uh, tech stocks. In this sense, uh, you know, the fact that China and the U.S. have a uh, there are strategic tensions between China and the U.S. Um, poses a risk to these tech stocks because these companies, they hold big data. And at the end of the day, the Chinese authorities do, do not want this big data to be in the hands of the U.S. government and U.S. investors. And so I think that mm. Chinese uh, Chinese authorities are going to most likely uh, attempt to um, you know gain greater control over these tech companies. OK, Rikai, that's interesting because back in 2021, I remember it was uh, very fashionable to talk about whether China was uninvestable. And that was for a number of reasons. It wasn't to do with COVID policy particularly back then. It was to do with the things that you're talking about there, about the clamp down on tech. So as we watch these gains post-COVID, what should we expect to see in terms of returning to previous valuations or levels with, uh, with Chinese assets? Well, I think over the coming months, there are going to be positive surprises like we saw today in the PMI data. And we are also coming up on the National People's Congress that starts uh, in a couple day, in a few days. Uh, and so that could also be a source of upside news for the Chinese economy. Uh, and that could support Chinese risk assets over the near term. But over the longer term, there are still headwinds that are going to weigh down on Chinese, the Chinese economy. For example, the global manufacturing um, cycle is still in a downturn. If you take a look at, for example, South Korean exports that came out um, just earlier today, that showed that they declined on a year-on-year -year basis. Uh, again, uh, manufacturing PMIs from the Eurozone and so far the flash PMI from the U.S. will get the update later today, but those are still in contractionary territory as YM consumers are still um, normalizing uh, their consumption of uh, uh, consumer durables following the pandemic binge. So I think that these are factors that are going to weigh on uh, the Chinese economy in addition to this, um, you know, the head Wins facing the tech, the the tech firms that are due to the structural long-term tensions between between the U.S. and China, which are not going to fade anytime soon. We heard Rakaya from uh, Wei Li yesterday at BlackRock. She said uh, equity markets are not pricing in the macro challenges ahead. We heard from J.P. Morgan's um, Marco Kalanovich yesterday. He said that. Um, equities are overvalued and at a risk of further losses because the divergence from bonds hasn't closed yet. Um, we're just hearing from a lot of people. Uh, Cliff Asnes, I think, said that the equity market really hasn't priced in um, inflation that's here to stay and a, a central bank that is determined to quash it. Do you agree? I do. If you take a look at, for example, the equity risk premium, that's very low. And that suggests that, you know, equities are not pricing in the risks of a tighter Fed, a tighter ECB that are pushing rates further into restrictive territory. Uh, and as you mentioned earlier, the data that we got recently from Spanish, French um, inflation yesterday, you know, we're going to get uh, the German inflation later today, the Eurozone inflation tomorrow. These are all so far pointing to inflationary pressures that are still persisting. And it seems that that's pushing central bankers to to continue uh, hiking interest rates deeper into restrictive territory, even potentially inducing a policy error in the ECB, which would be very negative for equities. Right. Four, five, six um, is a string of numbers I've heard recently a lot to refer to the ECB, the BOE and the Fed terminal rates. Does that make sense to you? Um, I mean, I think that uh, it, I think uh, the data that we're seeing so far is pointing to higher terminal rates. Um, and I think that, you know, what the message from central bankers is that they're willing to tell us, for example, President Christi Christine Lagarde is willing to tell us that she's going to hike by or the ECB is going to hike by 50 basis points in March. But then after that, they're going to be more data dependent. And the data that we're seeing so far suggests that there is a risk that they're going to hike further. And so that's ultimately going to push up the terminal rates, reduce the likelihood of rate cuts from these central banks 
at the end of this year. Um, and I think that, you know, this is something that we're going to have to deal with over the coming months uh, until there are clear signs that inflation is rolling over. So that's going to be continue to be the story in the meantime. Rukaya, thank you very much. Rukaya Ibrahim of BCA Research. Speaking of uh, the Bank of England, just hearing from Andrew Bailey earlier this hour, cautioning markets against assuming a rates move in either direction. So that's uh, that's uh, not clear. Right, coming up, Goldman's Investor Day pitch is failing, is falling flat. Sorry, with investors. Part of our interview with the bank's president and COO John Waldron next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an interview with the Coinbase CEO, Brian Armstrong. That's at 10.30 a.m. in New York, 3.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Now, Goldman Sachs. President and CEO John Waldron says the bank's partners are firmly behind its strategy as it contends with losses in its consumer business that have dented investor confidence in the firm. Waldron spoke with Bloomberg Shanali Basak at the bank's Investor Day in New York City. Well, we said earlier today to our investors that we, for the first time in four years, were able to bring all of our partners together for an offsite. We had many versions of that during the pandemic, but we couldn't get everybody together given the obvious travel restrictions uh, during the pandemic. So for the first time a couple weeks ago, we were able to get everybody together. And I would say it was a extremely productive and valuable meeting where people walked, our partners walked out of that meeting very optimistic about the future of the firm, very optimistic about the investments we're making in the forward of the opportunity of the firm, particularly in those two market leading businesses. And then like many others have questions about how long will it take to drive platform solutions to profitability. So certainly those questions come up. Some of those questions spill out into the press. But I think if you looked at our partnership and you walked around and interviewed our partners, they are firmly behind the strategy, firmly behind the opportunity, and very excited about what's in front of us at Goldman Sachs. I have to go back to a prior question because I feel like I still need an answer. Do you think that when it comes to the asset management business that you can do something transformative at this phase, especially given when you look around the markets that they've sold off so much? Well, if you looked our, look at our strategy and you listen to what we said today to our investors, we have plenty to do organically. We have significant opportunities in front of us to drive wallet share and grow financing in our banking and markets businesses. That's an organic strategy. In asset and wealth management, we have significant opportunities to drive management fees. We have significant opportunities to continue to invest in our platform operationally and to grow our wealth management business. All of those opportunities are organic. We can always look for inorganic opportunities. We have, as you know, we've made acquisitions. We bought a business last year in Europe called NNIP, which has added substantially to our European footprint in active asset management, has given us very interesting ESG capabilities across our asset management platform. Mm -hmm. There are always things we can look to do, but our appetite right now is most interestingly driven by the organic opportunity. John, I can't let you go without asking about the broader macro environment here. You know, just rate expectations have changed drastically in the last couple of weeks. How has it changed the calculus among your clients for risk appetite? How has it changed the calculus for you for risk appetite? Well, I would say if you think about what was going on at the end of last year, there were significant concerns in three primary areas. Areas. One was the European energy crisis. Two was China and zero COVID. And three was the performance of the US consumer. In all three areas, things have broken to the high side. We didn't see the energy crisis that everybody predicted, maybe somewhat driven by warmer weather, but it didn't occur. And so the European situation improved. Nobody predicted that the zero COVID policy would pivot very quickly to opening up China largely completely. That has changed materially. That's a much more significant upside surprise. And the US consumer has outperformed. John Waldron, Goldman Sachs president and COO, speaking with Bloomberg's Janali Bassett yesterday. And Matt, talking about the business, also giving his views on the macro picture. But on the business, I was taken by one of our colleagues writing for Bloomberg News saying that investors felt they had, or analysts felt they had, messaging whiplash at yesterday's event. When it came to the consumer business, what is it exactly Goldman's is going to try to achieve? How big will it be in the future? Seems to be one of the unknowns. Yeah, absolutely. They didn't seem um, very clear about that. I also thought it was interesting. You just heard John say, 
um, you had questions from their partners spill out into the press. And one of the concerns is that this bank just isn't transparent enough. Um, they're concerned about leaks, uh, and investors want information mm. to be very clear and accessible. So it seems like yeah. Goldman really needs to come to terms with that. And this only the second investor day to sort of underline that point. Right, coming ahead on the program, the road ahead for Tesla. Elon Musk lays out the company's master plan during today's investor day. So we go from the Goldman's investor day to a Tesla investor day. More on what to expect next. This is Big Bang. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Anna Edwards in London. Now let's take a look at what's ahead today. At 8 a.m. Eastern, we get inflation data out of Germany. Um, we have Maria Tadeo standing by at the Bundesbank. So in case it's crazy, we'll go live to her. At 10 a.m., U.S. ISM manufacturing figures come out. And ISM uh, uh, data is something that, for example, John Farrow looks very closely at. So we will highlight that. U.S. retail earnings continue with Lowe's and Dollar Tree after we've already had Walmart and Target, uh, as well as Home Depot. And then Tesla holds its investor day later today. Elon Musk will pry himself away from Twitter and unveil his master plan part three. Plus, hopefully we get an update on the Cybertruck. Anna, I've been waiting for the Cybertruck. When will we see the Cybertruck in real life? Well, shall we ask Craig Trudell? Yes. If anybody knows, he will know. Craig Trudell, Bloomberg <laughs> Global Autos Editor, joins us now for a preview of Tesla's Investor Day. You can answer Matt's question, <laughs> uh, Craig, or you could answer, or, well, and you can answer what we expect from today. I, I know as, as little about the Cybertruck uh, as anybody else. Uh, Lord knows when they're going to have this thing finally ready. <laughs> Uh, it, it absolutely is uh, one of the things that uh, Tesla's biggest fans are, are, are anticipating, have been since, uh, since we saw this thing, um, you know, several years ago now. Uh, uh, but there's also, you know, hopes for, for uh, a, a robo-taxi at some point. That's another thing that years ago, uh, actually, you know, when we talk about master plans, uh, part two, remember, he was, uh, Musk talked about, you know, going into every segment, uh, having, you know, trucks and buses, we have a semi that's just barely started deliveries. Uh, we don't have the robo taxis he promised. We don't have the self-driving uh, capability that he talked about. So uh, we also have to kind of consume today's headlines with some grains of salt. Here. On the other hand, Craig, you know, at the end of last year, beginning of this year, we were worried about demand issues at Tesla. Now we see they're ramping up production of the Model Y. And I heard from AMLO yesterday that they're going to build a whole new factory in Monterey, Mexico. So production is going to be boosted. Yeah, and I mean, let's take a step back and think about last year too, right? Where you know they opened uh, two factories. They were only making cars in, in, in two factory, factories in the world: one in California, one in Shanghai. And boom, in one year they have another in, in Texas and in Germany. Uh, now we're talking about uh, a plant going up in Mexico. Uh, Indonesia has talked about courting Tesla and, and uh, you know wanting them to be, build a factory there. Uh, so absolutely, uh, you know, we can expect. A lot of talk about expansion, about mm. more capacity. This is a company that has a sort of moonshot goal of making and selling 20 million cars a year by the end of the decade. Yeah. Uh, I, I think a lot of people would take the under on that, but of course, uh, they also have you know exceeded expectations uh, going back many years in terms of what the industry thought was possible. And just briefly, Craig, he's the richest man again, Elon Musk, thanks to Tesla share price recovering quite a lot in January, stalling in February. Just briefly, is he back in focus on Tesla? He's got a lot of other businesses to focus on. I think he also has his hands full with Twitter, but I think, you know, if, if there's been something that he's been more effective at lately, it has been sort of getting his message out at te uh, about Tesla, even as he's been up to his us usual shenanigans on the social mm -hmm. media service he owns now. Craig, thanks so much. Moonbase Craig Trudell with what to expect and how to read it from the Tesla Investor Day a little bit later on today. Uh, that is it for early edition surveillance is ahead. Tom, John and Lisa, they'll be hearing from uh, David Rubenstein of Carlyle Group, among other voices. Uh, we've had that Chinese uh, PMI data coming in higher than had been anticipated. We'll look ahead to the ISM. This is Bloomberg.